ask for it. Yes, you ask. Television's greatest all-time request show, brought to you by Skippy, America's largest selling peanut butter. If you like peanuts, you like Skippy. You ask for it. With your genie with the light white hair, Art Baker. Howdy, my friends, and welcome once again to You Ask For It. You know, this is a show that you practically write and produce yourself with a colossal request that you send in for the unusual, for the odd, for the daring, and, of course, for the impossible, too. I'm very anxious to get to this first request here because it sounds very exciting, and it's going to be, believe me. This is a race. It's a race between an object that goes way, way back in ancient civilization against its equivalent in this 1951 machine age that we have. Uh, Mr. Fred Grazer asked for this, and that's his picture up there, and here is his request. It says, Dear Art Baker, I would like to see which is faster, an expert using an abacus, A-B-A-C-U-S, or an expert operating a modern calculating machine. Thanks, Fred Grazer. All right, Mr. Grazer, you asked for it. As I walk to this spot right here, it's, it's rather amazing. I'm a separating mark here between an ancient instrument and a very modern one. But first of all, you spoke of experts that you wanted, Mr. Grazer, and we're very fortunate to answer your request by having two experts here. I great, take great pleasure in presenting to you uh, on our uh, modern side right here with the calculator that is the latest in its model, a uh, young lady who is an instructor at our great uh, Woodbury College here in Los Angeles. She is California uh, champion a comptometrist. And that is really something, and I want you to watch her fingers. And I'd like you to greet, please, at this time, Miss Ann Nidbella. <laughs> Are you, uh, you all keyed up? Yes. All right, now we have a champion over here, an expert also, believe me. Uh, uh, this gentleman is a graduate of the Lin Nam uh, Christian School in Canton, uh, 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 China. And he, as the owner of his own uh, insurance business, he prefers this ancient abacus here of his, of his ancestors rather than anything that man has been able to put up with his science in all of these years. In fact, that goes back 4,000 years. Just think, this was in use 2,000 years before Christ, the oldest calculating machine known. And so I take great pleasure in presenting to you at this time, Mr. Samuel Liu Ten. <laughs> we are familiar to some extent with the uh, modern machine, although we couldn't operate, of course, like the flying fingers of Anne here. Would you uh, please add nine and nine for me, please? Hmm, bling, bling. Would you add uh, five and five, please? Think, think. Now, uh, tell us a little bit about this, please. Just what uh, do these represent? Uh, this column represents units, tens, hundreds, thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand, and million. And on up, I see. Mm -hmm. Now, would you uh, uh, tell me uh, what are these up above, then? These are fives uh -huh. and fifties, five hundreds, etc. Oh, five times as much as these are worth here. Right. So what would five and one, of course, you'd put up a one from there, hmm? Yes. If you put up all these three ones, what does that represent? Six hundred and sixty-six. Six sixty-six. I think I know a tiny bit about it, but when you see his fingers fly, you'll wonder just what in the world. All right, now for the contest. This is exciting. I have here uh, what you will see on your screens at the same time. I have some problems that they will do. One in addition, there are four in subtraction, and there are four in multiplication. I have three cards. One is my own, which has the correct answer that has been worked out. Of course, uh, uh, not known by the two contestants. Now, I will give them on this signal, just so we practice it. As soon as I put them down, I'll try to put them immediately and say, go. Then you start. Now, this is to see who gets the problems done the quicker of the two. Now, when the winner wins, the loser keeps right on because I want to check how many seconds behind he or she will be. And this is really, just think of this. This is so-called primitive against the scientific, the ancient against the modern. All right, you have the duels? Are you ready? Let me put mine down, face down. Here we go. Start. There's the column, of, it has six figures, you know. There's the addition. And it's putting it down first. The modern machine is a little bit ahead, a couple of seconds, because here goes the answer there now. 
both of the answers are correct. They're on the first uh, subtraction. The modern machine has one done. He's working on the second one. The abacus is a little bit behind, not much, about four seconds. Uh, the third subtraction is there. All three are correct, all four so far here. All three are correct here. The fourth one is correct. Working on the fifth, one subtraction behind here on the abacus. Now we're on the multiplication. The multiplication, there's the first one. And working on the first one here, uh, I would say about a half a multiplication behind the abacus is. Second one is done. Both answers are correct over here. Checking on this one. She's got the third one done. And working on the second one is done. It is correct. That is correct there. Working on the fourth one. And it is correct. The winner is the modern machine. Anne Nidbella. Congratulations. a very gracious loser. And by the way, my friends, it isn't very usual that the abacus loses. There have been many uh, of these. That doesn't mean that you have lost any of your touch. Perhaps in the perfection of these machines, there has been something that has speeded it up. Now, uh, from this, I draw one conclusion. We have gained in 4,000 years since this was first used, up to this greatest of all, my friends, we have gained a total of six seconds in that time. Isn't that wonderful? We appreciate very much you helping us to answer this request. It was delightful in you, and I think that was an exciting race. And also, to letter writer Fred Grazer, thanks because you asked for it. Aha! Peanuts! Peanuts I have here. But I want to now, before I get to uh, raving about these, I better kind of check with you. Because if you don't like peanuts, I'm sunk as far as you're concerned for about the next 50 seconds. Because you won't be interested in what I have to say, and if you were to go out to the kitchen someplace there, you won't miss anything that'll interest you. However, if you do like peanuts, I think you've got something that's interesting. Now this, uh, this here, this, this is peanut butter. I mean, it's made from peanuts. Now the odd thing is, though, we discovered that there are a lot of people who like peanuts who do not like peanut butter. And we found the reason for that, too, because peanut butter as such uh, quite often turns stale and rancid and hard to digest. But let me make this very simple. If you like peanuts, you will like Skippy. You see, because you like it, is Skippy is the one and only peanut butter that removes the stale makers. That's the uh, chemical substances that uh, turn ordinary, uh, make an ordinary uh, peanut butter turn stale, you see? Now, however, uh, the result is that Skippy stays fresh right down to the last spoonful in the jar. Oh, it's great stuff. I really want to tell you that. Uh, but I want to make one more point clear, and it sounds funny every time I say it. Uh, Skippy does not taste like peanut butter, but it does taste exactly like plump, selected, fresh roasted peanuts. So I end by saying, whether or not you like peanut butter makes no difference. If you like peanuts, you will like Skippy, and that's a fact. <laughs> Pierce, we have just established contact with your dear departed husband. Listen. seen a spook crook in action. And he and his kind last year gypped the American public out of $125 million. That's an amazing statement. And it prompted Stuart Jamison of Orange, New Jersey, that's Mr. Jamison there, to send in this request. Dear Dart Baker, thanks for your courageous expose of card sharks last week. Our family would like you to ex expose the fakers among the spiritualist mediums. Would you dare expose some of their tricks on your show? Sincerely, Stuart Jamison. All right, Mr. Jamison, you asked for it. Yes, 
Yes, we dare expose this, and we're very fortunate in being able to present to you a man very capable and eminent in the field uh, of who can expose this. And this gentleman is the director in the American uh, Psychical Institute of, uh, and uh, is Dr. Harroward Carrington. Thank you, Mr. Baker. I should like to say just here that I do believe in the reality of certain psychic phenomena. At the same time, all we spiritualist investigators know that there is in this field a vast amount of fraud, illusion, and nonsense. And as an example of the sort of thing you may encounter while investigating, I should like to show you some of the tricks which you may see presented by such fraudulent mediums. First of all, however, you might like to know how the bell and the tambourine were lifted into the air. Well, by a very simple device, a black silk thread and my assistant. They're raised in this way and float about the room. Just here, however, I will cut the threads connecting these two objects, and they are now free to manipulate on their own account. One of the commonest forms of psychic demonstration is what is called wraps, wrappings. <clears throat> you take your places around the table, the fingers upon it, and if you listen very carefully, I think you will hear the wraps going on. Listen. How is that done? By slipping the fingertips very gently over the top of the table, beautiful wraps may be produced. You can get the same result by putting the boot heel against the table leg. The vibration runs up the leg, wraps seemingly occur in the tabletop. Another common demonstration is what is called table lifting or levitation. <coughs> the medium and his assistant take their places on opposite sides of the table with their fingers on top. And as you see, the table is made to rise and float in the air. How is this done? Both of us wear on our wrists cuffs such as this with a hook. If the hook is inserted under the edge of the table, you can see that the table is raised very nicely. Another method of producing this table levitation is by means of another hook here supported by the neck. This inserted under the edge of the table will raise it and you don't even have to have your hands touching the table at all. <coughs> Among the commonest of demonstrations are those in which bells and tambourines float in the air, regardless of any threads. Usually this is in the dark. In order to simulate darkness, I shall cover these with a large handkerchief to shut off human vision. And nevertheless, you will see that as I hold the handkerchief here with both hands visible now, that the bell and the tambourine will play of their own accord. Now I will turn the handkerchief over and you will see the rod and the fake hand into which I insert my own. But when I release my hand from this, I am then free to ring the bell or produce any manifestation desired. One common form of demonstration is what is known as slate writing. Ordinary slates are shown blank and cleaned on both sides. You take the two slates like this, one, two, three, four surfaces, place the slates together, they are held by medium and assistant. If you listen very carefully, you will, I think, hear spirit writing in process. Listen. Ah, spirits are writing a message. Let us separate the slates and see what is on them. Yes, a message from dear Granny. How is it done, you say? By many, many methods. One of the commonest is what is known as a flap. A flap slate on one slide, side and newspaper on the other. The flap covers the writing. As I place this on the newspaper and lift up the slate, the writing, of course, is now here. It is placed on the top of the other slate, and naturally, when the slates are separated, 
the message becomes immediately visible. There are many, many other methods. This is one. The sound of the writing is produced by scratching my fingernail very lightly on the undersurface of the slate. One of the commonest of all demonstrations, which I will do last, is this trumpet. You've heard of trumpet phenomena. <coughs> now, voices come through this and talk to the circle in pitch darkness. If the medium talks into the trumpet, as he almost invariably does, you can see that by pointing the trumpet in different directions, the voice can come from the floor, from the ceiling, from this side of the room, this side of the room, and appear to wave about the room in various quarters and produce a very eerie effect. And so, ladies and gentlemen, if you happen to go to a fake medium's place and see phenomena such as those I have just presented, why, don't come to me. Just remember, you asked for it. A very splendid job, Dr. Carrington. We appreciate very much your uh, being with us to give this expose. In five minutes, you have exposed a racket that has cost the American public $125 million annually. Thank you again to letter writer Stuart Jamison of Orange, New Jersey. We thank you because you asked for it. And by the way, that reminds me that until you ask for it, of course, nothing happens on this show. I want to just mention that before we go into the next spot because your toes will be tapping on this next one here. And so put your thinking cap on and ask us for the unusual, for the daring, for the uh, near impossible. That's what we're here for and we enjoy. Here's our number. It is You Ask For It, Box 323, Hollywood 28, California. Thank you. Now... Kind of a warm place, if you know what I mean here. Your toes will be tapping in rhythm to this, believe me. I'm mighty glad I came down to this country, and I'm so glad for this uh, request that came in from Jane Hymer of Sacramento. Thank you, Jane, very much. This is what it says, Art Baker. I have heard of calypso singers and dancers from Trinidad who can make up a song or a dance about any subject at all, but I have never seen them. Are there any in this country? How about it? Sincerely, Jane Hymer. Well, good. All right, you asked for it, Jane Hymer, and uh, we are very fortunate to be able to uh, give you the answer to your request. Because we have right with us here a very famous dancer who uh, introduced Calypso dancing and singing to the American theater. I want to present to you Calypso Joe and his charming partner, Coco T. if you don't mind, charmed indeed. I want to find out about Calypso, and many people also would like to know just what the meaning of the word is, what happens, and uh, about the Calypso songs. Will you explain to us? Well, Calypso songs are storytelling songs from the island of Trinidad. They're humorous and satirical, and in these songs we sing about uh, love, of course, mm -hmm. and we sing about, uh, well, the latest scandal too, really? and the news of the day, and even about real estate advertising. Just as it comes to you. you know, well, Mr. just like uh, the old troubadours used to do in the old days with their guitars. And you make it up as you go on. Oh, yeah. Right, I right on the very moment. Much. I would like to hear a sample, please. Coco T, uh, what's cooking with the latest Calypso news today? Sing it. Philosophy. What? You are pretty gun, you say, Margaret, singing flat. Mr. Truman, go get you with a baseball bat. Me daughter sing a sweet soprano. I know because I play the piano. What? All the acting bomb make a big explosion. Let's hope it's not for world destruction. We got to have peace and harmony. Let our children live in peace and prosperity. Oh, Coco, tell them. Florida where the sunshine glows, but everybody now wearing winter clothes. On the beach, nobody swim. They got too many goose pimples on their skin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Sounds marvelous. Just in the spur of the moment, make up something. A romance. Right. Now about the dances, please. What happens with that? Well, uh, calypso dancing are 
also humor, storytelling, and satirical dances. Well, you know how boy meets girl here. Well, you We should. like to give you our impression, for example, how boy meets girl in Port of Spain, Trinidad. Of course, in Calypso style. I should like... are now looking at a slice of bread being spread with creamy style Skippy peanut butter as only Mary Ellen can spread it there. All right now as you look at that I want, don't want you to leave me because I want to show you something believe it or not that a lot of people like even better. Suppose we were to take some uh, some fresh roasted peanuts here and uh, like Mary Ellen has been doing all evening and putting them in a nut chopper here. Uh, give a couple of more little chugs will you please? Mm -hmm. You think that'll do it just fine. Now you find in there some just tiny little golden nuggets of roasted peanuts, and they are colossal. Now I want to try something here. Suppose we were to take these, now let me tell you experiment, do you mind, honey? And uh, we'd sprinkle them over the uh, creamy style skippy. Say, how is that, huh? Woo, that looks good. It does look good. All I did that for was to tell you that you can get that and enjoy it anytime you want. You won't have to go through any chopping process either because the Skippy people do that for you in chunk style. That's done for you up in the factory. Now, uh, uh, chunk style, you see, has sprinkled all through it very generously through the entire jar uh, those golden little nuggets that you saw there, just about like that. So that's already done for you there. Now, of course, uh, either style, whether it's cream or uh, chunky, if you get Skippy, you are getting the peanut butter that stays fresh right down to the last spoonful in, in the jar. And so I make it very simple again. I want you to know that this is an honest fact. If you like peanuts, you'll like Skippy. <laughs> You've got a kick out of this one, believe me. This was sent in by uh, uh, Virginia Hall. Yes, it's a lady from Salt Lake City. That's her picture up there. Listen what it says, Dear Art Baker, I'm a wrestling fan, but my husband says that wrestlers are just big gorillas with a lot of muscle and no brain. I think he's just plain jealous, and I tell him so. But I'm asking to see one of my favorites do something on your show that takes brains outside of the ring. Sincerely, Virginia Hall. Virginia Hall, I'm very glad you asked that, and that you got an argument with your husband, because we can grant it in an unusual way. You'll see one of your favorites. In fact, you will now see the one and only, the great, gorgeous George. It's delightful to have you answer this request for us, George, indeed. Thank you, Art. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, gorgeous George, did you hear what the lady's husband said about it? Yes, I did. And it's evident that this woman's husband isn't up on his American history. Oh, really? Because four of our former presidents were wrestlers. Really? And 18 of them wore long hair. Oh, so. Yes. Who were the wrestlers? Buchanan was a wrestler, a judo expert. Mm -hmm. Teddy Roosevelt used to strip to the waist and wrestle with his men. George Washington was a wrestler. And last but not least, 
Abraham Lincoln was a champion wrestler. Uh -huh. Also, he was a professional wrestler because he received $10 for his efforts once. Now, there, take that, uh, Mr. Hull. Uh, you learned your history, Don. I'm glad you told us about yes, that. Yes, and 18 of these former presidents wore long hair and used the curling arm because they didn't have a Frank and Joseph as I have. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I'm glad of that. Let me take one more look. Now, about outside of the ring, uh, using brain and things like that, can you answer this request for us uh, in some way? Uh, what do you do beside uh, tossing pianos around, things like that? What do I do? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe my brains are in my fingers because I am a, uh, a card manipulator. Card manipulator, that I'd like to see. Do you and, happen to... And it just so happens that I have a deck with me. Let's have some of them. Show the folks yeah. out there now, will you please? Yes, I will. Ladies and gentlemen, here I have a deck of cards. And here is an eight of diamonds. Now I'm going to show you something that's very simple. Now I have to do this very slowly so you folks can see this. And I hope that you catch me if possible. There is a seven of hearts. Naturally, you think I have something in the hands, but strangely enough, I don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now I'm going to turn this deck over in this manner, just like this. And I want to change it to a black ace of spades. May I do that again, Art? Mm -hmm. And watch this very closely, if you will. There is a four of diamonds. Uh -huh, I like that. Very simple, isn't it? And now, Art, if you will assist me, would you like to select a card from this deck? I'm a good card selector. Any card that you wish. Sure, got this one right here. Shall I look at it? Yes. Show it to them? Yes, show it to them. All right, what do I do? Now, I'd like you to place that card back in the center of the deck. Good. Now, if you will, in one move, uh, tell me where you want this card. Top, bottom, or the middle of the deck? In the bottom. On the bottom. And there you are. Right there on the bottom. Mm, no, no. Oh, I beg your pardon. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe it's here on top. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry. Oh. Beg your pardon. What was your card? Queen of Diamonds. Not on top and not on the bottom. Oh, well, there. Oh, very good. Thank you. Got one. Got it. There you are. Mm-hmm. Place the card back in the center of the deck. Right. Door. There you are. Now, Art, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to thrust my finger in the deck in this manner, and I'm going to pull your card out, and there you are right there. No, I ain't. Yep. Oh, I beg you your pardon. You're a little off tonight, I guess. There must have been a mistake. I beg your pardon. What was your card? Six of clubs. Six of clubs? Well, that's what I've been showing you. Oh. Mm -hmm. There you go. And now, Art, I'm going to try one more trick with you. Uh -huh. uh, would you mind picking up that thumbtack, please? Mm hmm now, I'd like you to select another card anywhere in the deck that you wish. Just reach in there and get you it. You got a good one, I think. All mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Now, if you will, will you put the card back in the center of the deck? And now, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to put that thumbtack, thrust it into the center of the deck somewhere, just about where you think that you put your card. Mm -hmm. About there. Mm -hmm. And there we are. Now, I'm going to count to ten. And when I count to ten, I want you to call your card out real loud. Uh -huh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ace of club. Ace of club. And there you are. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Lord. I think that'll kind of make the lady change her mind there. Uh, before leaving, I'd like to let you in on a little secret. Would you like to hear it? Yes, yes. I don't well, think that I have the most beautiful hair in the world. I don't think I have the most beautiful clothes in the really? world. I don't think I'm the most handsome man in the world. Oh, really? And I don't think that I have the most beautiful robes in the world. In fact, I don't even think I'm gorgeous. Oh, really? But what's my opinion against millions of others? <laughs> <laughs>